Welcome to lecture number four in Paul 311. In this uh, lecture, we are going to discuss the emergence of the Zionist movement in Europe and its later unfoldings in Palestine. Zionism is the modern national movement of the Jewish people. It emerged to give a solution to the predicament of the Jewish people in Europe. It had mainly two practical sources. One was the failure of the emancipation project in Western Europe, where some countries attempted to promote equal rights and equal citizenship for the Jews. And on the other hand, it was motivated by persecution and anti-Semitism going on in Central and Eastern Europe. So this is the um, political background for the emergence of a national movement that in its features was very similar to any other European national movement, but it was aimed and shaped to give a solution to the predicament of the Jewish people in Europe. In the Russian Empire, the Jews were massively ghettoized. They were in fact allowed to live only within what was called back then the Pale of Settlement. This was quite a big region of the Russian Empire where all the Jews could live. They were not allowed to own or buy land or even not to work on the land. They were restricted in the sense of the sort of occupations they could perform and also in terms of education they could get. So they were very harshly discriminated against. In 1881, the Tsar of the Russian Empire, the Tsar Alexander II, was assassinated, to which follow a brutal wave of pogroms against the Jews, particularly in southern and western Russia. As a result of these pogroms, many Jews left Russia, mainly to the United States, and few of them opted to immigrate into Palestine. The person who first led the Zionist movement, and in fact organized it from the beginning, was a Viennese journalist and essayist named Theodor Herzl. Herzl's vision found expression in a small book he wrote, Der Judenstadt, or The Jewish State, um, in which he, in fact, reinvents Judaism away from just a religion to become, in fact, a national ideology. Erza believed that the only solution for the Jewish people in Europe is to live. In fact, to leave Europe for a new life in a new land. At the beginning, Erza explored a number of ideas for a new land where the Jewish people from Europe could establish themselves. Ideas like um, the Patagonia in Argentina, or Uganda in Africa were raised, but eventually 
the appeal of the history of the land of Israel, particularly for the biblical significance and the attachment of the Jewish people to this land, was the one that was chosen as the Zionist option to be adopted. So, Zionism, as we said, appeared first as a sort of intellectual conceptualization for the predicament of the Jews in Europe. But in fact, it was formulating a solution for the discrimination that the Jews were experiencing all over the continent. Now, I believe that this, at this point, it is important to clarify the following. The, motivation, the motivations for Zionism to emerge were very significant and real. Antisemitism existed in Europe. Jewish people were suffering for centuries, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe. And this is why the idea of trying to find a new land where European Jews could establish had a very um, le legitimate origin. However, choosing the land of Israel or Palestine was bound to be more than problematic. And this is simply because we already know that Palestine was not inhabited. In Palestine, as we said before, about half a million people were living. The natives of the land were both the great Arab majority and also the small Jewish Sephardic and Mizrahi minority that lived together with the Arabs. So you can already imagine the sort of problematic potential of an idea that is about bringing people into a land where native people have been living there for more than a few centuries. Herzl sought to institutionalize the Zionist movement from the outset. In 1897, he organized and convened the first Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland. Jewish representatives from many parts of the world, particularly from Europe, came to the Congress. Herzl's political preference was to seek first international legitimacy to the Zionist project and to the idea of finding a land where to settle European Jews before Jewish European immigration takes place. We call Ertel's political preference as political Zionism because it put the political goal before the practical aim of moving people from Europe into Palestine. In contradistinction to Herzl's political preferences, or as we call it, political Zionism, it stood practical or territorial Zionism. We commented in the slide before about the assassination of the Tsar Alexander II and the programs that um, came after that, 
Tsar Alexander III enacted a series of laws in 1882 that put even more restrictions on the Jewish population living in Russia. Many more of Russian Jews emigrated against mostly to the United States, but at the same time, a number of groups started to organize to send people, mainly young Jews, from Eastern Europe into Palestine. I would like to mention two main groups or societies at this point. One is the Hovevei Tzion societies. Hovevei Tzion in Hebrew means the lovers of Tzion. And the other group or society was called the Bilo, which is an acronym. These two groups of people send um, a number of groups into Palestine very small groups. The first Bilo group, for instance, were just 14 immigrants. Later in that year, in 1882, these two groups put together the settlement of Rishon Letzion, today a big city in Israel. Rishon Letzion in Hebrew means first to Zion. And this was the very first Zionist agricultural settlement that was established in Palestine on land purchased from an Arab village. Another other um, settlements will be established in the years to come. At the beginning, um, Jewish philanthropists were those who supported this small settlement. I would like to add a few more words about the Zionist Congresses that were taking place in different cities across Europe, and in fact were the first framework through which the Zionist movement, the Zionist organization, formulated policies. In the years to come, the Zionist Congress will be creating executive institutions, particularly those that will manage the project on the ground in Palestine. We will come back to that. As I said before, in 1897, Theodor Herzl himself organized and convened the first Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland. This was, in fact, the official launching of the Zionist movement, even though, as we commented before, on the ground, there were already a number of organizations, of groups, moving into Palestine from Eastern Europe. At that first Zionist Congress in Basel, a manifesto was adopted, which basically stated that the Zionist movement aspires to create an asylum for the Jewish people in the land of Israel, guaranteed by international law. The second Zionist Congress, a year later, added the imperative of colonizing the land of Israel, that is, Palestine, for the purpose of creating that asylum for the Jewish people. Now, I would like to clarify that I'm not using the word colonizing just as a form of verbal interpretation on my side. Colonization was a word that was used and was part of the Zionist lexicon already at that time of the first Zionist Congresses. A year later, in 1899, the third Zionist Congress was convened 
and at this point a chartered lease from the Ottoman Sultan was sought as the form of international legitimacy for the Zionist project. So what you need to understand at this point is that the Zionist organization had already in mind Palestine as the land where Zionist immigration um, should come into. Palestine was the place where the asylum for Jewish people coming from Europe will take place. And the leaders were aware that some form of international legitimacy is needed in order to properly frame this project of immigration of Jewish European people into Palestine. Now, Herzl did try to meet the Sultan, the Ottoman Sultan Abdul Hamid II, for the purpose of gaining his approval for the Zionist project in Palestine. Eventually, after a number of attempts, Herzl uh, managed to meet the Sultan in May 1901. But Herzl did not get anything from his meeting with the Sultan. On his own side, the Sultan himself met Herzl because he believed in the possibility that the Zionist movement could help the Ottoman government in refinancing the empire's debt to the European powers. He believed that European Jews have certain power over European finances and therefore Herzl perhaps can be able to help him with his debts to the European powers. Once the Sultan understood that Herzl cannot deliver that kind of help, the Sultan was not interested either to help Herzl in granting any kind of legitimacy for the Zionist project to take place in Palestine. Now, the Zionist Congresses continue to take place at intervals of one year later two years until the outbreak of second world war there was a eight-year break during first world war and after the second world war it continued to be hell in average of every five years this year in 2020 is supposed to take place in jerusalem So, what do we have so far? On the one hand, we have a native population of Arabs and Jews living in Palestine under Ottoman rule, living for centuries quite in harmony, even if not a perfect harmony. And on the other hand, we have a Jewish national movement in the making in Europe trying to respond to a necessity of European Jews. These two realities are going to collide. Now, when we think in terms of a national project of creating a sort of asylum or national home in a particular place, undoubtedly the essential condition for that project to succeed, though not the only one, but the essential condition is immigration. 
you cannot create an asylum, you cannot create a national home on whatever land without moving the people that you want to create an asylum for into that new land for them. So everything that we will see about the Zionist project will be first of all immigration. Obviously immigration will not be enough but that is the essential condition. Zionism as part of its lexicon created a special word for Jewish immigration into the land of Israel, into Palestine. The word is Aliyah. Literally, in Hebrew, it means ascension. So, what in fact this word means is that a Jew coming into the land of Israel is not merely immigrating, but is going through a process of ideological, moral, and spiritual elevation. So as you can see, Zionism was creating, alongside the practical goals, also a political language that attempted to accompany those practical goals. In the same fashion as Zionism uses Aliyah or Ascension to depict immigration into the land of Israel, it uses its opposite, Yerida, which in Hebrew means descent, to describe the process of leaving Israel which implies, from a Zionist point of view, I would say, until these very days, as a process of morally descending. Zionism started to organize itself in Europe, sending people into Palestine, we can distinguish between a number of waves of Jewish immigration from Europe into Palestine. Or, if we like, a number of Aliyot. Aliyot is the plural for Aliyah. The first Aliyah took place between 1882 and 1903, the second Aliyah, 1904-1914, there are reasons for these dates, and so on and so forth. You have there in the slide the approximate number of Jewish immigrants that moved into Palestine. It is important to note that not all of these people remained in the country. Many of them, many thousands of them, in fact, left for a number of reasons. The conditions in Palestine were not that positive for all of them, so many people left. What we are going to do in the next slide is to understand better the particular characteristics of the first Aliyah, or the first wave of Jewish immigration into Palestine, where these people went to, where they established themselves, and eventually the idea is to understand how the natives of Palestine, both the Arab majority and the Jewish Sephardic minority, received them. What was the interaction between these groups? So, again, I believe we can here distinguish and keep in mind 
across three groups of people. We have those European Ashkenazi Jews coming mainly from Eastern Europe under the banner of Zionism, immigrating into Palestine with the view of establishing their, their new national home. And on the other hand, we have two groups, both natives of Palestine. They Arab majority, mainly Muslim, but also Christian Arabs, natives of the land, living there for more than just a few centuries, and alongside with them, a small Jewish Sephardic and Mizrahi minority. So we need to learn to understand the relations that are going to be formed between these three groups, between the Zionist Ashkenazi immigrants, the Arab Palestinians, the Arabs living in Palestine, and the Jewish Sephardic Mizrahi or Oriental Jews also living in Palestine. The early Jewish immigrants into Palestine they saw themselves pretty much in the same fashion as white settlers perceived themselves in North America and Australia, for instance, that is, as pioneers, as people who are bringing Western civilization into a non-Western land. In this case, Palestine was conceived as the Orient, and in this regard, I refer you to our first lecture about Edward Said and Orientalism. In Hebrew, pioneer means halutz, plural halutzim. And this is how these Jewish immigrants coming from Eastern Europe conceive themselves. In contrast to the sort of very urban occupations that um, these Jews had back in Eastern Europe, the Zionist idea was to settle these people as farmers. But since these people were not trained in agricultural work, Remember that, for instance, in Russia, they were forbidden to work the land and they were not allowed to own land at all. So these people were in need of training. There were some agricultural centers for where they were trained in Europe and also in Palestine itself. So these immigrants, the trajectory was that some of them arrive at this teaching farming center where they were trained, where they uh, were taught how to work the land, and eventually, if they were lucky enough, they were allocated land bought by either the Zionist movement or Jewish philanthropists that were interested in helping these Jewish immigrants to Palestine. Now, in spite of the fact that Zionism was predicated on this idea of changing the occupations of the European Jews, on reconnecting the Jew to its ancestral land, the biblical land of Israel, most of the Jewish immigrants that came into Palestine during the first periods and also later, in fact, settled in towns and urban centers, not in rural areas. Let us focus on the first Aliyah, the first wave of immigration. Um, the approximate numbers that we have is that 
during these years around 25,000, perhaps a bit more, of Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe came into Palestine. During this period, 28 settlements were established. These settlements were called Moshava, singular, Moshavot, plural, which basically means some um, form of settlement. About 360 families were granted with tracts of land from these 28 settlements. The process, more or less, was that the Zionist organization, or mainly in this stage, wealthy Jews from Europe, such as the Rothschild family were buying land from Arab landowners and granting this land for housing and agricultural use to the Jewish immigrants. Obviously, only a small minority of these immigrants in this period were allocated with land to live on um, usufruct and the majority of the Jewish immigrants coming into Palestine during this period were in fact landless and had to look for work either as hired workers in these settlements that were being formed or in towns and cities. The form of settlement that consolidated during the first Aliyah, we call it the plantation colony. The plantation colony, as in other parts of the world, where colonization processes took and were taking place, this model is based on private ownership, in this case, private Jewish ownership, and the tracts of land are worked by the owners and also, and mainly, by higher workers. Now, there is a question who the plantation owners had to work on the land. For instance, in 1890, we know and this data is taken from Gershon Shafir's book, we know that all the Moshevot employed about 5,000 workers. Only 1,200 were landless Jewish immigrants from the first Aliyah. The rest, that is the majority, were Arab farmers or Felahin. So, as you see, these plantation colonies were not able or willing to supply enough work for the Jewish immigrants coming into the country. We need to understand that if immigration is the sine qua non condition for a project of national home, such as Zionism, to be developed, it is not a sufficient condition. You can bring people, but still, you need to develop housing, work, and eventually society and culture. So the question of work and labor became very rapidly very essential for these Jewish immigrants coming during the first Aliyah. Without keeping the people, keeping these Jewish immigrants in Palestine, obviously the Zionist project was doomed to fail. These plantation colonies during a first period and until the year of 1900 were 
subsidized by rich Jewish philanthropists from Europe, mainly the Rothschild family. In that year, the settlements, the management of the settlements was passed to the Zionist global organizations. So again, the main point about the first Aliyah is that even though during this period a significant number of Jewish immigrants, Zionist immigrants, were coming into Palestine and were establishing new Jewish settlements in the country, these settlements did not allow for enough absorption of mass immigration simply because the tracts of lands that were allocated to few families could not or were not willing to offer enough work for the other Jewish immigrants coming at that time. This is a problem that is going to be resolved only during the second Aliyah that we will talk about next week. Another word that we need to add to our political lexicon is the word Ishuv. Ishuv in Hebrew literally means settlement or community. Plural, Ishuvim. It is at this point in time that the word Ishuv is being more and more used, particularly by the new Jewish immigrants. And a new distinction started to arise between the old Ishuv and the new Ishuv. The old Ishuv being that Sephardic and Mizrahi Jewish community, natives of Palestine, that used to live together with the Arabs of Palestine. And the new Ishuv was the formation of this new settlement established by Jews from Europe, Ashkenazi Jews, Zionist Jews, coming into the country to build a new Jewish community. So as you see, we have a distinction between two forms of Jewish community and this is going to be a distinction that there will be much more to add to it in the next weeks to come. In this map you can appreciate the different Jewish Zionist settlements that were established during the first and the second Aliyot. Altogether about 50 new settlements. In the map you can also see the most important Arab towns and cities. When you look at all these new settlements, I reckon that one main question still that need to be answered by us is how the native of Palestine reacted to this immigration and establishing of settlements. Let's have a look again at some demographics. If just before Zionist immigration began in 1882, the Jews of Palestine, the Sephardic and Mizrahi communities altogether were about 3% of the population only. Less than 10 years afterwards, and during the first Aliyah, the population doubled. In 1908, already into the second Aliyah, the number of Jews living in the country was about 80,000 
around 11% of the population. Of these 80,000, 30,000 belong to the new issue, those new settlements established by the European Zionist Jews immigrating into Palestine. As you see, still before World War I, the Ashkenazi Jews in Palestine, the Zionist Ashkenazi Jews, were not the majority within the Jewish community. But this is going to change very soon. There is an aspect we have not addressed in regards to this Zionist immigration and establishment of new settlements in Palestine. And this is the aspect of how did the Ottoman government react to this Zionist project? Well, the Ottoman government was not sympathetic to this unfolding on the ground. And there were a number of reasons. First of all, and perhaps most importantly, the Ottoman government feared that Zionism, as other national movements before, would split another territory from the empire, in this case, Palestine, as it happened before with regions in the Balkans, Eastern Europe and Northern Africa. So the reaction of the Ottoman government was to try and restrict Jewish immigration from Eastern Europe into Palestine and also to restrict land acquisition to build new Jewish Zionist settlements. In addition to that, there were two other reasons why the Ottoman government did not react positively to the Zionist project. One was that we need to keep in mind that the Ottoman Empire was an Islamic empire. So the Sultan Abdul Hamid II saw himself as the religious leader of the Muslims in the empire. Easing immigration for the Jews coming into Palestine People who were claiming to base a homeland in Palestine, obviously at the cost of the expenses of the local population, could certainly anger Muslims in Palestine and across the empire. The third reason was that most of these Jewish immigrants were coming not just for Eastern Europe, but particularly from Russia. Russia was the arch enemy of the Ottomans. These two empires have been at war for the last years, a number of times. So the Sultan wanted to prevent any further Russian influence within the empire by allowing people from Russia, regardless of the fact that they were Jews, settling within Palestine. Did this policy bear any fruit? The broad answer is no. Overall, Ottoman policy to stop Zionism, both immigration and land acquisition, failed. Jewish immigration continue to flow into Palestine and Zionist organization and Jewish philanthropists continue to buy land. This happened mainly because of the Ottoman corrupt administration. Administrators were um, always easy to buy and in that way to overcome regulations and there were other ways around that the Jewish immigrants and the Zionist investors found to bypass the Ottoman official policy against Jewish 
Jewish immigration and land acquisition. At this stage, in order to consolidate everything we have been talking so far today, I'm asking you to watch the first 22 minutes of a documentary uh, called Seeds of Conflict that you will find in Moodle within the folder Movies. Now, this documentary in its first part will help you uh, making more sense of the sort of topics that I raised today during the slides. And once you've watched the first 22 minutes, I'm asking you to come back to the slides because in the next um, there will be a series of questions that will help you um, putting together all this knowledge. Now, you don't need to submit in any way the answer to this question. These questions are more a sort of activity to help you um, consolidating your knowledge.